Hey, it's Ingrid. In today's video, we're chatting with fabulous composer Stephen Bryant. Stephen has written music for all sorts of ensembles from gigantic orchestras and choirs and bands right through to solo pieces. We'll be exploring with him how to get to the composer's intent in the music, how to practice in ways that can help you be more expressive, and a few challenges around his really interesting and exciting piece, Hummingbird. Hope you like it. You can look down in the description for links to particular topics that we cover. Great. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing, I'm doing well, all things considered. How has it, um, all of this coronavirus affected you? Well, I should be in South Carolina right now. There should have been a concert uh, last night at the University of South Carolina. He was going to do my concerto for one ensemble, which I don't get to hear that often. So particularly bummed not to, to be hearing that one live. Um, and yeah, everything for the rest of the semester is canceled. All the gigs. I had a, the U United States Marine Band was supposed to play the same piece uh, in April. So I was really looking forward to that. But so cancellations, obviously, for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife, Verena, you know, she's the, the went ensemble conductor and, and at Duke University. And of course, they're doing everything online and canceled for the rest of the semester as well. So yeah, same story everywhere. How about you? Yeah, same thing. Uh, had was really excited. I was going to be conducting Mala One for the first time uh, on tomorrow, our time. Uh, that's not happening. Another concert next week, uh, which was a collaboration with a cartoonist and orchestra, uh, which was going to be really cool. But you know, got to keep safe. Uh, so. No, absolutely. No, I. I this is everybody's made the right decision in doing all this yeah. it's, i have no doubt of that so we'll see but for now this is our reality i'm at home in my studio for me though it's not that radically different yet i'm used to going seven or ten days at a time without even leaving the house and so i've been as a composer living in isolation for long stretches i've been training for this for years <laughs> Well, what advice would you have for, uh, you know, ensemble members, whether they're in a school or a university, as someone who's kind of used to just <laughs> buckling down and doing work? Um, I should have thought about this. Uh, you know, I, so I, I'm an introvert, first of all, so that I have an advantage there. I'm, I'm happy to be focused on my thing here in my room with all of my tools um, and making things. Um, one of the things that I always preach to uh, young composers, and hopefully this will apply or be adaptable to players in general and anyone, is to not make every project a serious project. Have fun and play. I'm using this time right now, actually, I'm going through all of these old files. You know, I've, I've talked for 15 or 20 years about making an electronic album. Um, and so I've got all these half finished fragments of electronic tunes just made for fun. Um, but most of them aren't finished or not polished or any of that sort of thing. So I'm actually digging through all of them. They're not made for commissions. They're not for anyone serious. I wasn't sure I was going to ever show any of them to anybody. They're just made for the simple joy of making things and learning along the way how to use the software. And that's one of the beautiful things about playing with computer software and electronic music or playing your instrument is you just play have fun it doesn't matter if I, it, it's awful you know that's how you get better and um it's also kind of try to rediscover the joy of whatever pull has pulled each of these people into music to begin with there was something about it that fascinated you from the beginning for me it was the notation and just making the sounds and putting them together but you know playing your horn playing your instrument there's something that has sparked that interest way, way back. Maybe for some of them, they're younger. It's not way back. But um, try to rediscover that and, you know, play by ear if that's not something you've ever done um, or not great, you know, put on a recording you like. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what kind of music and try to play along. Mm -hmm. um, but try to find what's fun about music and do that. That's my first thought. And uh, obviously you, you mentioned electronics and that's something that has featured a lot 
in a lot of your different compositions that is maybe in some ways quite unique to the way that you write. If there were musicians out there that wanted to kind of get into that or have a play around with that for the first time and they've never done anything like that, what would you suggest they could do? Um, well, the first thing is no fear. There's not like you can do damage, just whatever software you can find and afford. I mean, obviously it gets very expensive very easily, but there are still plenty of pieces of software that don't cost anything or very little. Um, and just get a synthesizer out or a, uh, whatever you can find and start playing and learning. That's how I learned how to do all of this. Back when I was in college, there were no courses in any of this stuff. Um, I figured it out just by doing. And, and it's a beautiful thing. It's like, well, that doesn't work or that sounds awful. Okay, try something else. Try this. What does this knob do? What if I move these faders? What? I don't even know what these things mean. What is an attack envelope or a decay or sustain? Well, you read up a little bit. That's pretty straightforward. And once you start just playing with what those things do, you get a, a start to develop a feel for them and um, play the same thing. Use a project as a way of learning how to make a, a set limits for yourself, first of all, because it's sort of overwhelming. You know, with if you have a, a trumpet, there's three valves and um, there's a range of sounds that it can make. And not that it's a, not a wide range of sounds, but it's still very contained, it's defined. With electronic realm, absolutely everything is possible. Um, and so it's sort of overwhelming that way, so limit yourself. And I think that's a advice I give to composers in general is constrain yourself, use a small amount of material to make something. Same thing with electronics. Choose two sounds, what can you make with those two sounds? Don't get lost all day going through, because I do that. I have more sounds than I've ever heard or will have time to ever listen to. And then I make my own. Um, but just start playing. Uh, I, I can't think of what software to recommend. I mean, it's going to be different for each person and what platform they have and all that. But grab whatever you have at hand or can download and start playing and see what it does. Don't worry about whether you're doing it right or not. Just do it. Yeah, and I think that that is such great advice, that idea of play, because right now we're in this time where we don't have all the kind of normal structures that we have of school and lessons or college and classes, whatever it is for different people, and maybe being used to being really directly told what to do and, oh, do this thing and then this thing will happen. This is like a great opportunity for us to get back to that, oh, I'm just going to play around and, and see what happens, which, as you say, in the midst of that, there's going to be lots of mistakes. And, mm -hmm. and it, getting back to the fact that a mistake is not a bad thing, because that can be a really easy thing for us musicians to do if we're in a practice room with an instrument and a sheet of paper that makes us think that there's a right or a wrong. Exactly. No, the mistakes are necessary. You yeah. need to make if you're not making mistakes, then you're probably not making progress. I think that's a great thing for all of us to hear all the time. Oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm telling myself that as well. I, I, these, all these electronic tracks I'm pulling out, there's a reason I've not shown people because a lot of them aren't serious, some are ridiculous. They're certainly not polished. It's the sort of stuff that I, you know, I don't share, but now I'm thinking, like you said, sort of everything's on hold. The hierarchies of everything are on hold. So. I think I'm just going to show them all to the world and like, say, hey, look, here's some crazy stuff I've made for no particular reason. What do you think? And you're, I'm sure people are like, well, that's kind of cheesy or that's boring or irritating or eh, it's not like what you normally write. Yeah, I know. I do all sorts of stuff. And so I, it's sort of mentally freeing too. Like, look, here's who I am. Here's some crazy things I've made just for fun. Maybe I was just learning how to use this one filter on this one synth on this thing. That's all the reason I made this. Um, so yeah, use this space, this this kind of this destruction of regular life as a way of getting outside of whatever boxes you put yourself in. Well, let's talk a minute for um, about the piece Hummingbird that uh, okay. you and I mentioned earlier um, before we started recording. Uh, now, I didn't know this piece before uh, you suggested it as part of this conversation. and. 
Oh, it's super cool and super interesting. Can you, uh, we'll put a link to it in the description, but can you tell people about this piece? Sure, it's actually 17 years old now, I, I realize. Um, actually, it's an ex a very good example of what I was just talking about. I just, I just gotten this software back then, it was brand new 17 years ago called Melodyne. It allowed you to pitch shift and sort of like auto-tune but this was very early when very few people had that opportunity and I could actually take audio and fix it. So I said, all right, I'm going to make something. And the only sounds I can use are me and this microphone. And I'm not a good singer at all, but with the software, I can just nail the pitches, nail the rhythms. I have like a five octave range. It's amazing. And it just sort of cut out the middleman. So I, every sound in that is from my own voice. Um, and in fact, this microphone right here, I've had it that long. It's the same one. Um, and uh, I set those rules for myself and just make something. And over the course of about 48 hours, I just, this whole thing unfolded because I, I limited the choices. So any sound I wanted, all right, I can't go searching through synths or how do I make that sound? Just get the microphone, make it as close as I can, and then um, fix it from there. And it just, I, I don't know, it's one of those rare moments when you're in the zone and something happens very quickly and it's just, it sort of unfolds before you. you. You're almost riding this wave of, I don't know how this is happening, but I'm just, I, wish, I wish it would happen more often. Um, so it was a very, very uh, blindingly productive weekend back in 2003. And how did you then um, take that from this piece with all these vocal samples to then these instrumental versions that you have? Uh, in 2000. 12, I think it was, Robert Benton, a euphonium player, wanted me to write a piece, and I thought this would be a really fun adaptation um, because uh, singer Hila Plitman had already done that. I made a version for her. She's this really amazing soprano. Um, and I took all the tracks, so it was like in my software, which actually I can show you, it's the same software I use today. It's open right here on my computer. It's called Digital Performer. Um, has all these tracks, lines for each of the different voices. And what I did is I muted, I took out a whole bunch of the lead melody lines and just created the space, made it into an accompaniment and then notated a bunch of stuff. And um, then Hila had sung and improvised some lines. So I went back and notated what she did and then transferred some of that to Euphonium and adapted the Euphonium uh, for him. Uh, and, you know, obviously you have to fix some ranges and change some things about what's possible. Um, and then I, I've adapted it from there for baritone, baritone sax and for bass clarinet, which I haven't put up on the website yet. Um, so I just, you know, muted a bunch of stuff, wrote some kind of new lines that fit those instruments over the top of the track. And do you have anything that you would um, like the viewers or the listeners to do uh, in relation to that track or kind of listen to it and listen out for? Um, sure, one of the, you know, what was really freeing and what's really freeing with the software is learning how to wrestle it to the ground. So there's not like there's a single uh, time signature or mm -hmm. exact loop in there. Uh, one thing that happens a lot with electronic music, it's very easy to do is loop things exactly. Four bars of four, four, for example. Um, and I very much don't want to do that because our ears very pick up immediately on exact repetitions, but small variations we also pick up on. They are much more exciting. And so I never repeat anything exactly in that or in any other piece. Um, and if you try to count the meter along with it, see if you can figure out where the meter is because it's changing constantly. Um, but I also don't want that to feel that way. I, I want it to be transparent. So you're not thinking, it feels fluid and natural. But then once you try to take it apart, you realize that this is not at all predictable or regular. That might be a fun puzzle. That would be a fun puzzle. Uh... I'm sure the, there are now going to be all, all these people around the world kind of like tapping in time to Hummingbird trying to work out, is that a three or is that a seven or? There's a lot of four, four, but it's not all four. I'll tell you that. And I think that idea of kind of engaging with music from the other end, because so many of us are um, performers and we're used to kind of receiving the score from you, the composer, and then kind of translating that into sound. But then to go the other way and have the recording and go, oh, what, how is it just by ear of going, how is this constructed or how is this put together? I think is so valuable for us to kind of take the notation away 
because we can get really um, wedded to that. Oh, that's a very good point. And that's something I want, and I think any composer wants musicians to do, is not be wedded to the notation. That is a very imperfect, um, necessary evil, trying to communicate uh, these ideas, but so much is lost. And I know it's not a new idea, but you have to constantly remember it because you're looking at this paper or the screen with these black and white information. It is literally in black and white, but it's missing so much. Sometimes from the composer's error, you know, things are often so obvious to us that uh, we forget to put them in or they seem obvious and then you realize you get in rehearsal and like, oh no, that wasn't clear. Um, but also just the spirit and the style of music, uh, as simple as swung eighths versus straight eighths, that can be noted the same way and yet sound radically different. Um, that's just a very small example. So please don't be wedded to that. Try to see beyond to the larger goal, larger musical journey, arc of a piece and, and gestures. What's happening, what, like a lot of runs I write for the woodwinds or anybody. I wanna end up here, I wanna start there. All right, I just fill in the notes that go in between and whatever, you know, I don't really care that much. Just it needs to, this gesture all needs to happen and ends right there. The end of it is much more important than all the little notes in the middle. That's another just tiny example, but that's how I think. I don't care about all the notes in the middle. I just want to get from here to there. Um, so you have to, it's a lot more work, but you have to think larger about what is this supposed to sound like and kind of work backwards and, and reverse engineer it to where my mind was when I was sitting here alone coming up with this. Well, and I think one thing about, um, us trying to figure out, like we start with that black and white piece of paper and then trying to work out, well, what, what was Stephen really trying to say? How do I get into Stephen's head? Is knowing what, um, what kind of a person you are. Because I think in, even in our digital world where there's like so much access to information, we can look up your website, anyone from around the world and read your bio or look up um, other interviews and things that you've done. Um, what would be something if you wanted to give um, people who haven't worked with you before or haven't heard your music before, like a little snapshot of you as a person to kind of understand you a bit better that then they could bring if they were going to play your music? Wow. What would be a good, um, asking me to like self assess who I am and what, um, well, I know that what I want to hear in any of my music, regardless of the genre or the instruments it's for, is a, a really clear direction and purpose and meaning to it. Um, I love drama and music. I don't really love drama in life, but um, I want the I want it to be like it goes forward on rails and like very clear communicates very clearly and with efficient purpose but interest, um, and hopefully I do that with my words as well. Uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I'm talking, so <laughs> there's a bunch of words. Hopefully that answers it. No, I think that really does answer it because again, that's saying that um, what what is gonna be that great synthesis or matching between composer and performer is really what's not on the page in a way the clues to that are on the page of creating that sense of direction and drama and forward motion that, but as we, as the performers really have to be collaborators with you in that and, and okay. contribute to kind of making that direction happen. Cause if you just play, as we know, if you just play everything like perfectly what's on the dots, that doesn't make an amazing, transformational no. performance no if it's boring it's wrong and really perfect sterile performances it's not that it's not that i mind good intonation don't get me wrong um it's when it's played with a sort of careful fear and if you let the fear and the precision suck all the life out of it um then why are you doing it yeah 
because we should just be doing it because we love it. Yeah. Bring the craft to it. Practice your scales. Learn how to play in tune. All that stuff's really important, but they're just tools. They're tools to build the, the thing. They're not the end point or the goal. Well, and I think that's a great thing that we could also help people think about at this time is it would be really easy to spend this time when we're all kind of shut in our little room and practice the the scales or the, the technique exercises or whatever it is. And that's great. And maybe this is a good opportunity to, to sit in a room with a tuner or a metronome or whatever it is. But the, the purpose of doing that is to serve something greater, to mm -hmm. be able to tell a story. So what can you um, do in your practice to kind of tell a story with that scale? Like, where is that scale going? We're talking about direction or, you know, or what if I play this, um, I don't know, F major scale with animosity or like anger? Like, how does that sound different if I play it with serenity or something? Absolutely. Then you're not just practicing scale, you're practicing character and control of the instrument and how to make it convey something more holistic. I think that's a brilliant idea. And then it's a bit like you kind of playing with the software because you're just kind of playing with the instrument. Oh, well, if I try and make it angry, like what does happen to the sound? Um, and then we start to kind of come to what you're doing as a composer kind of from the other side of, oh, well, you know, when I was trying to make it um, really serene, it was this tone color and it was this dynamic and I used this articulation. Oh, well, maybe when I see that in a piece of music, um, that a composer has written, or oh, maybe maybe they try to communicate serenity at this point, or maybe they're trying to communicate something calm. Yeah, I absolutely agree. They should probably record themselves while you're doing all these different things so you can go back and objectively figure out what, what was I doing and how did I do that? Also because our experience externally versus what we're experiencing internally while we're doing it are very different. So more information never hurts. Yeah, that's a great idea of recording yourself while you're doing it. So then you can actually see what, what the audience sees. Yeah, exactly. I hope that you enjoyed our conversation with composer Stephen Bryant. Make sure that you check out his website, www.stephenbryant.com, where you can look at heaps of recordings of his pieces. Make sure to check out Hummingbird and you can also download scores of lots of his pieces. And if you want to learn how to follow a score, make sure you check out our video on how to read a conductor's score and we actually use his piece Bloom for that. If you found this video valuable, make sure to share it with your friends, fellow ensemble members and other conductors so that as many of us can learn from Stephen as possible. We'll be back tomorrow with another video. Until then, happy musicking.